probably a really, really good idea, right? So uh, just a little bit of a reminder, uh, you know, the <laughs> church at Philippi is uh, a church in Europe. So this is the first converts in the, in the continent of Europe that are ones of the Lord. Uh, if you remember the story from the book of Acts, uh, you know, uh, Paul had uh, began the second missionary journey uh, with the idea of uh, retracing his steps from his first missionary journey. And, uh, yeah, of course, John uh, Mark uh, and, and Barnabas, uh, uh, who were with him on the first missionary journey, wanted to go with him once again. And then there was a, uh, a disagreement about taking John Mark along. And so Barnabas and John Mark went one direction, and Paul and Silas then took off to retrace the steps uh, of the first missionary journey. But then they got to a place where they weren't sure really where to go. Paul wanted to go on down into the Asia and back to Ephesus once again, where he had founded the church in Asia at Ephesus. And then he also had the thought of going northward into Turkey, maybe for the first time. And the Holy Spirit had forbid him to go in both directions. And so uh, he had came from the east. So there was really only one direction left to go, and that was west. And uh, that's when Paul gets this vision of, the, uh, of someone from Macedonia calling him to come on over there and to share the gospel message. And so we learn later in the book of Acts, chapter 16 through the first part of 17, that this person was probably Lydia in her prayer group that met down by the riverside. And uh, in answer to this prayer group's prayers, Paul made the great crossing into the continent of Europe and to this church now at Philippi. And Lydia probably comes the very first convert on the continent of Europe. And uh, she was from the city of Thyatira, uh, which also became a church then later on. But she's most likely a member of the church of Philippi. And we also know that uh, the Philippian jailer and all of his family are no doubt members of the church at Philippi, as well as many others that were met along the missionary journey uh, by Paul and Silas. And then they were actually, uh, you know, uh, thrown in uh, jail then, you know, later on. And so it's been two years now since the church at Philippi has seen them because uh, they were, Paul at least, was thrown in jail. Uh, you know, for preaching the gospel. God had told him early on in, in Acts that he would not only preach to the common folks, which he had been spending a lot of time doing, but that he was also going to be able to preach the gospel in Rome. And so that's where we find Paul. He's in Rome. He's actually handcuffed to a member of the Praetorian Guard. And so uh, he's sharing the gospel now with those who are part of Caesar's palace. And so he's sharing the gospel with kings and, and royalty. Uh, at this point. And so uh, that kind of brings us up to where we are as far as the background of Philippi once again. And then he says, uh, you know, to the saints, uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all of the saints who are in Christ Jesus. So one of the things that we didn't really cover too much yesterday is that saints are those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, I like the way that uh, somebody else said it, you're not, you're not a saint, you're an ain't. <laughs> you ain't in Christ and you ain't none of his, you know, so saints are in Christ. And uh, so this, uh, it's written, it's written to the saints who are in Christ and they're in Philippi. And uh, so we talked yesterday about that the healthy church has uh, disciples, has disciples. And so you see Timothy and Paul together and uh, that a healthy church has uh, godly leadership and overseers and deacons. And that a godly church is filled with grace and with peace, uh, which is spoken of in the very first, first part. And then Paul reminds them that uh, he's thankful in his remembrance of those, those in his prayers each day uh, because they have been part, partners with him in the gospel. So uh, he had equipped this church to do the work of the ministry, and they weren't sitting on their heels. They weren't sitting in the pews. They were actually doing the work of the ministry. And so Paul was commending them for that and uh, saying how joyfully that made his prayers for them uh, each and every day. And then he reminded them, uh, you know, that the one who had began a good work in them, that he would complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so, you know, whatever day and whenever that day comes, that 
you know, we can rest in the assurance that the work that he began in us as a person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to complete the work. And so we should be growing more and more all the time in our inward being, even though our outward being is constantly perishing and returning to the dust of the earth, right? Questions or comments thus far? Okay. In verse 7, he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because uh, all of the people at Philippi were in Paul's heart. Uh, and then he says, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. So in other words, because they had participated in the ministry, then Paul was also assuring him that they were uh, participating in this glory of the ministry now as it was being expanded into the regions of Rome and even to the very house of Caesar. And so, you know, uh, he's saying, look, don't worry about the fact that I'm in jail. Rejoice in the fact that the reason why I'm here, God is using for his ultimate purpose for me, which was to actually end up at some point preaching the gospel in the palace of Caesar. And that's exactly where he's at, doing what God told him he was going to be used for in the very beginning. And that's, that's comforting for uh, ministers and for uh, even, uh, you know, as all of us as our ministers of the reconciliation, just like Paul, sometimes we don't know what direction to go, you know, and so uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes and he shows us in the right direction to go. And sometimes we stand at a crossroads and, you know, we're not really sure which fork to take. And uh, so, you know, that's when we have to use our, our gut feelings and, and our consecrated minds and our sound minds to make a decision. And if we get started down the road and find out that it's not the right road, then we need to have the sense to come back to the crossroad and take the other road because that one is now revealed as the right road because the one we took isn't working out right? And uh, so sometimes it, we're led through circumstances as well. Amen? Amen. Yes. <clears throat> Paul told them that his prayer with, for them was that they would abound more and more in love and that, uh, you know, this church at Philippi, um, other than a small little disagreement between a couple of women in the church in some later chapters, uh, there's not much correction to the church at Philippi here. It's a church that's in love with one another and the minister's in love with them and they're in love with the work of God and things are working the way that they should work. They're participating in the sharing of the gospel and they're partners in that work and they're even partners with Paul while he's in chains. So as soon as they found out that Paul was in chains in Rome, because they really didn't know at first, then they sent their pastor, Epaphroditus, uh, with an offering to help Paul while he was there in prison in Rome. And we'll learn later in one of the other letters and later in this letter that that's uh, also one of the other ones that are there with Paul besides Timothy is that the pastor of the church at Philippi has brought an offering to Paul to help him while he's in bonds and chains, right? I, well, I got a question for you. Uh, sure. That if... Uh... All right, Paul's in jail and for pre preaching the gospel, correct? Oh. Yep. Okay. So, but he got, the jailers let him continue to preach the gospel, even though he's in jail for what, he's, that's why he's there. <clears throat> why do you suppose that is? Well, where was Paul originally put in jail for preaching the gospel? It wasn't actually in Rome. Uh, he, was, he was put in jail uh, there in, uh, you might say, the, the, uh, the neighborhoods of, of some of the seven churches that were founded by him. And so basically it's, uh, you know, one of the other members of the Church of Philippi that we forget about is the woman who was demon-possessed and who followed Paul and Silas around saying, these are the most high servants of the most high God, and did that for days on days on end. And then Paul finally turned around and cast the demon out of the woman, but she had made a lot of money for the soothsayers in 
the neighborhood of Philippi. And so it was actually the unbelievers in Philippi who had thrown Paul in jail. And uh, they actually wanted to kill him. And then Paul said, uh, uh, I am a Roman citizen, so you have no right to arrest me because as a Roman citizen, I have the right to take my case before Caesar. And so that's how we're actually how Paul ends up in uh, chain to the Praetorian Guard uh, in Rome is because he had made the claims that he was a Roman citizen, which wasn't a claim. It was true. He was. He was a Roman citizen, right? And so they had no right to try him there under Felix or any of the rest of them. He had to be taken to Rome and stand before Caesar or at least the high court in Rome, right? Okay. And so Rome hasn't necessarily imprisoned them for preaching the gospel. Rome has received him into their prison because he was arrested in a Roman province of Philippi. And they don't know the whole story yet. So while he's there, he's really awaiting trial. So they're not preventing him from doing anything because they don't know what he's actually guilty of yet. The trial hasn't even taken place. He's, he's awaiting trial, right? He hasn't yet appeared before Caesar, but he is chained to one of the members of, of the Praetorian Guard. And so as he, as he shares the gospel with the Praetorian Guard and he shares it with others of the Praetorian Guard, it begins to spread throughout the Roman palace long before he ever even goes to trial. So before he goes to trial, much of the palace of Caesar has already been converted to Christianity. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. That yeah. that make it a little clear? Yeah. I, well, I understand that. Yeah. So, okay. A, a, bait, a bait and switch there. So kind of. So well, say. yeah, by God in a, in a sense, right? Because yeah. God had told him that. You know, that uh, on, you know, when they were uh, on the ship, and of course, this goes back to the shipwreck and all of that, Paul had told, or God had told Paul, don't worry about it, the ship's going to wreck, but all your lives are going to be spared, because you have to stand before Caesar and bear witness to me, right? And so, in a sense, Paul knew he was going to make it there, right? And he told everybody else, as long as you stay with the ship, you're going to survive, but if you jump ship, you, I can't promise you you're going to survive, right? You're, you're going to lose the ship and everything on it, but you're not going to lose your lives, right? And then, of course, he ends up on another island where he gets bit by a snake in the meantime, but that's all a, a completely different gospel, right? So <laughs> that's just some of the background of where we're at, right? Yeah. I'll be right back. Go ahead. So... <laughs> Beginning then in verse 12, Paul then says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And that's what we were just talking about. All right. What All happened right. to him actually served to advance the gospel. And so Paul was rejoicing in the fact that the gospel was being preached, right? And then he goes on to say, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So Paul was sharing his story of, because I'm sure that some of them want to know, why are you in here anyway? I mean, you know, you know, what crime did you commit? <laughs> you know, why, why are you going to appear before the high court and before Caesar? I mean, who are you that you get to do such a thing? You know, what, what crime have you committed? So then Paul could tell them, well, I'm actually in chains for preaching the gospel. And they probably, no doubt, is that anybody would be, what's the gospel? And so then that opens up the opportunity for Paul to share what the gospel is with them. And so now people are starting to give their lives to the good news about Jesus Christ, you know, and they're converting to Christianity, right? And so Paul says that as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard why I'm here, and I'm here, you think I'm here because I was arrested, but I'm actually here because God sent me here to spread the gospel, right? Even in prison. So no matter where we go, we still spread the gospel, right? And right. it'd be easier for somebody to just instead go, well, I started out serving you, Lord, and they threw me in jail, and now here I am, and woe is me, right? 
And yep. Paul didn't look at it from that way. He looked at it as an opportunity to advance the gospel of Christ, right? And so there's always two ways that we can look at something, and Paul chose the better way to look at it, right? <clears throat> then he goes on to say in verse 14 that because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly, right? I mean, Paul's in jail for preaching it, but if they throw Paul in jail, then probably everybody else can get away with it for a while because the focus is on Paul, not on them, right? And so then he goes on in verse 15, and he says, and it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and jealousy or rivalry, but others out of goodwill, right? So while Paul is enchained, many people are taking advantage of his being in chains to preach the gospel, but they're not preaching it with pureness of heart the way Paul had done it. They preach it out of envy and jealousy. What do you think he's talking about? I have not a clue. Why? False preachers? Is that what you say? Diane exactly. says false preachers? Not real. Not not real? What? Not like Paul. They were real preachers. Reminds me of the Pharisees. Huh? That, that uh, you know, that preached, uh, but didn't live up to what they were, what they were preaching. Is that like more so they're only like saying certain things, like preaching certain things to make it seem like they're in the right? It could be. Uh, I think it's probably that or so much more than that, but uh, anybody else? Anything else you want to chime in? Diane's shaking her head no. <laughs> okay. So this has gone on forever. <clears throat> um, out of envy and jealousy is, is that there were some who either were or were not called also to be preachers who were envious <laughs> of Paul's results with the gospel and jealous of his recognition. And all of those things still go on today. Uh, some people <laughs> preach the gospel, but they're actually preaching it because they're envious of somebody else's results or jealous of somebody else's results, and they're in competition with those results. And it's been going on since the beginning of the Christian church, and it'll probably continue to the end of the Christian church. Um, and Paul said, you know, uh, basically, don't worry about it, is what he said. You know, but why does this happen? In Paul's teaching and, and back in the uh, Corinthians about we've all been given a, a gift and each one of us have been given a, a different gift. And so it's kind of points maybe to the fact here that there were those who were preaching the gospel and because they wanted to have the same kind of success that Paul had but perhaps they don't actually have the gift. And so they're trying to use the gift that they don't have instead of using the one that they do have, right? And you've heard me uh, relate to that in a way that, you know, there are mama called preachers and daddy called preachers and church called preachers. And then there's the ones that God called, right? And there's a big difference oftentimes between them. And the others are oftentimes envious and jealous of somebody else's results and somebody else's recognition uh, that goes with that sometimes, right? So it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and jealousy, but there are others who preach it out of goodwill. So some of them are still preaching out of goodwill and in his absence of being in jail in Rome, 
they're in a sense filling the gap and they're continuing to preach the gospel in the regions of where Paul preached it because I mean, Paul's obviously can't do it. So some are preaching it out of goodwill. They're preaching it in love and preaching it out of necessity for the gospel to continue to be go forth in that area. And others were doing it for selfish gain, right? And then Paul said, the latter do so in love. Those that are doing it out of goodwill do so in love. And if you're preaching and you're teaching out of love, you're not jealous or, or envious of somebody else's results, right? Because love doesn't do those things, right? Love is not envious. Love is not jealous, right? All those things in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. So if you're preaching Christ in love, then you're not jealous of anybody else's results. You're only worried about getting the good news out where God has sent you to get it out, right? And everybody else has the way in which God has given them to get it out. And you should rejoice that their results are what they are, even if yours aren't the same, right? <clears throat> and if you're preaching it in love, you will be. And that's what Paul is saying here, that, you know, they, the latter preach it in love. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. So many of them took advantage of Paul being in prison to not just preach the gospel, but to denounce Paul's apostleship. And, you know, that might have taken the form of things like, uh, if he was really an apostle, what's he doing in jail? And what do, how, do we really want a jailbird preaching to us? You know, so they were taking advantage of his situation to belittle his apostleship and to take advantage of that for their own selfish ambition, right? And things like that still take place today, unfortunately. But Paul then goes on in verse 18, says, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And in that I result, or in that I rejoice. So God is able to use even the preaching of the gospel in false motives to still use the gospel because it's still the good news about Jesus Christ. And the gospel will stand all by itself regardless of the motives behind which it is preached. And Paul said, hey, I rejoice in the fact that the gospel is going forth there while I'm here in chains, even though I know some of them are doing it from a wrong motive and some of them are doing it for the right motive. It doesn't really matter. As long as the gospel is going out, God will use it, right? Because it is the word of God that convicts hearts. It is the spirit in the word of God that convicts, convicts people of sin and convinces them of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's not the preacher, right? And as preachers, we have to keep that straight in our own minds sometimes that the results are not dependent upon me. They're not dependent upon my polished presentation of it. The results are completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who takes the words and convicts people's hearts and is the Holy Spirit that then turns around and convinces them that what they heard was the truth and convinces them of the salvation and the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ so that they'll surrender their lives to the Lord. And so it, it's not dependent upon the preacher. And we forget that sometimes. We beat ourselves up worse than most anybody else ever beats us up because if I could have just said it more clearly, if I could have just said it more plainly, if I would have just not wasted so much time on this thing over here and been more direct to the point, maybe more people would have heard it. We beat ourselves up all the time. And we always have to be constantly remind ourselves the results don't depend on me. If I say what I was told to say, I'm released. And the results are totally up to the Lord, right? And if we can keep that simple thing in perspective, then the power of God can move, right? <clears throat> Questions, comments? You know, sometimes when the preachers preach, and it's kind of like, why are you stepping on me today? You know, yeah. but he, if, if the Lord's telling you, it's for you. Right. You know, it's like Paul saying, it don't matter where I am, as long as the word's being served, you know. And, and sometimes people feel like they're being stepped on because 
you know, it hit too close to home or something, you know. Right. My old uh, mentor used to tell me all the time, when you throw rocks at the dogs, the only ones that whelp are the ones you hit, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, that sounds cruel, but what he's saying is, is that when you preach what God tells you to preach, the ones who usually respond aggressively against it are the ones that got convicted that you were speaking to them, just like yeah. you're saying. And it made them angry because it always accomplishes two things, right? Either it makes them angry and they, re, and they, re, uh, they then uh, respond in anger or it humbles them and they surrender, right? Yeah, repent, yeah. Yes. Any other comments? Okay. So Paul goes on here in verse uh, 18, or uh, <clears throat> the, the, the rest of verse 18 and into 19. He says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers, and the help that is given by the spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He's confident that he's going to be delivered, right? Mm -hmm. And how is he confident in that? He's confident in that by not only his own prayers, but the prayers of everyone else, right? Yeah. And it's given by the spirit of Jesus Christ. The only way that you can receive guidance and direction and refreshing from the Holy Spirit is through prayer and through prayerfully studying the Word of God, right? Because the Word itself is spirit and it is life, right? And so Paul says, because of your prayers and my own prayers, I'm confident in the Spirit that deliverance is going to come because God hears and answers prayer, right? And so he makes that statement, you know, right up front. And then he says, and I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul's main concern here is that he won't be ashamed, right? I'm going to preach the gospel and I don't want to be ashamed of preaching the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who hears it to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Right. And the only way he's going to be ashamed if he backs off from preaching it the way that God is telling him to preach it. Right. Then you stand ashamed before God because you didn't do it the way that the spirit led you to do it. Right. You did it in some other way. And there are going to be a lot of people that are going to stand ashamed one day, right? Yeah. And Paul's oh, you, saying, it, I don't want to be ashamed. Go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, you don't want to be embarrassed about what you're talking about. So you right. must believe what you're talking about. Right. If you believe, then it should, should be coming out as what you do believe. And uh, so you shouldn't shouldn't be uh, be embarrassed about what you're doing. Right. So, and there there I know there's times that uh, I see an opening and I hesitate and and I and I sit back and I think about that later on and then I I think well the next time that I have this opening uh, I'm going to approach it in a different direction and so. Uh, I've got another candidate that I'm going to be working on here before long. Uh, I've mentioned this man before and that has uh, cancer. And I hate to get people when they're down and out, but it seems about the only time that they want to listen is when they're down and out. So, yeah. and uh, so I've got uh, another one here. And I, I got another one that I was working on. And I'm going to, as soon as the grass starts to grow, I'm going to approach him again. Hey, did you read that brochure I gave you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and you know, and what you're saying, Jim, is you know, and 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 then you you have to approach it in the right way, you know, because you don't want to be ashamed of the way you do it or embarrassed by the way you do it, and so you don't want to take a in a sense advantage of people when they're down and out. But you know, you go to them and you talk to them and you try to find out, you know, how how is your spirit? How you know are 
how are your emotions and everything holding up, you know, in, in no, what's going on in your life right now. And then you, you know, you hope at some point that the door opens up to be able to ask them the tough question. What if this was it? Right. Right. What, it, if, this is, what if this is it for you? Will you allow me to speak to you about that for a moment? And then I'll let them give you permission to speak about that into their lives, you know, and then you say, if this was it, do you know where you would go? Are you confident of that? And are you assured of that? And if they are, then you can rejoice with them. Yeah. And if they're not, then it's an opportunity to share the gospel with them, right? Yeah. Exactly. You know, and and both of these guys have cancer, mm -hmm. you know, different types of cancer. And when, uh, you know, I tell them, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you. And, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yes, 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 please. And, uh, but then, well, prayer, you know, it goes a long way. But if you're not right with the Lord and the end does come, then all my prayers will uh, go for naught, I guess. So, and so you, you got to open that door and not be embarrassed to talk. So, it's, okay, not rambling on my part. Uh, and you know, we can all be, especially as preachers, we can all all be guilty of this thing. Like we maybe tried to open that door to speak with someone who's in a condition like that, and they didn't open the door. Because can I speak to you life about that? No, I really don't want to hear that. Okay, can I pray for you? And then we preach the gospel in our prayer <laughs> after they already said they didn't want to hear it. You know, right. I mean, we're masters at that sometimes. I I found myself doing it many, many times. And then I, I would go, I just violated their will. <laughs> you know, they told me they didn't want to hear it. And I preached it anyways. I just turned it into a prayer. Right. You know? well, yeah. <clears throat> but, and, but and since we have to be been, careful of that, too, you know. Right. But since you have started, you know, you've been telling us periodically that you that you've been praying for us, everybody by name, specifically. I've changed the way that I've been praying here lately, and I've been throwing their name out every Praise day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that their cancer will be taken care of, but I also hope that they will repent from their sins. So, right above all else, Lord, I pray for their soul. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Amen. Yeah. Good, good so. deal. Right. <laughs> Whoops. What happened there? Ah, I brought up another screen. That's what that was. <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what you were seeing. I wasn't seeing it over here. Yeah. <laughs> I threw it up in front of my screen and I couldn't see my own screen anymore. So uh, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will be the sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, how our lives would be different if we would just keep that very simple thing at heart. To live is to allow Christ to continue to live in me. And to die is to just get more of him, right? And I have nothing to fear in any of them because he's already beaten everything. And so I, I don't have to fear the dying part. No. <clears throat> and if I'm gonna continue to live, then it's going to be Christ continuing to live in me and me continuing to allow that to be so. And if, you know, I'm not in Christ like a, like a, but before. If I'm not a saint and I'm not in Christ, then I'm an ain't and I ain't in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't none of his, right? But if I'm a saint, then right. for me to live is Christ, right? And for me to die is but gain, right? I mean, I'm just going to get more of Christ when I die, right? Amen. So Paul says, then if I am to go on living in the body, then this will mean fruitful labor for me because he's saying God has been blessing even here in prison. So, I mean, if I go on living, he's just going to keep right on blessing what he's called me to do. And yet I don't know what road to choose here. You know, I don't know. He says, I'm torn between the two. 
I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. I mean, if God would just call me home and take me out of this prison and take me on home, that would be better by far, right? But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. In other yeah. words, God has called me to a specific task. He's continuing to bless that. So for me to stay here among you is actually for your betterment. And what is life anyways if it's not for the betterment of other people? It's not about me, right? And Paul is really kind of saying that here. It's not about me. Hey, I know that if this ended at death, I'd be better off by far. But I really believe through prayer that God is going to deliver me out of here because I believe that he wants to continue to bless what he's doing through me. And that is for your benefit. And that is a good thing, right? Questions or comments? So Paul says in verse 25, and I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that this is God's will. And I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. In other words, Paul says, look, uh, man, I appreciate your prayers. Love what you're doing, you know. And I love the fellowship that we enjoy. I love this church because they're they're doing what they should do. They they listen to the instructions and they're following them. And even whether as they're they're uh, the one who founded the church is off in Roman prison, their pastors went to visit him and take him an offering to help him out. So they're still participating in even a continent away in Rome, right? And uh, so you might say that uh, Paul founded the church and then when he became a missionary, they continued to support his missionary efforts, <clears throat> even after he was in prison for doing so. And then Paul says, you know, I'm confident that, man, <clears throat> God's gonna let me return back to that church. He's gonna let me stand there and preach to you in person again one day. I'm confident of that in prayer, all right? And that and that's going to cause your joy to overflow because that's what you're praying for as well, right? They long to see Paul again. All right. They want they want him to come in almost like guide them or yeah. lead them, whatever. So right. So we're going to end it right there, uh, and then verse twenty seven we'll pick up tomorrow, uh, as he then you know, kind of reminds them that whichever one does happen, I'm confident this is one thing has happened, but just in case I'm wrong, <laughs> whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, right? Amen. I'm confident you're going to see me again. I believe I have that answer and prayer from the spirit of God, and I'm confident in that, but you know, things change, <laughs> you know, and, and we roll with the changes, you know, day to day sometimes, right? Sometimes we don't know what tomorrow holds. And when tomorrow gets here, we go, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Right? Ain't that the truth. Kind of like this COVID-19, right? We all of a sudden, you know, it was here and we go, well, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, but Daryl, look at how many people are in the word. Absolutely. You know? It has turned it out just, for the good, hasn't it? Yes. It just, my heart just, oh, is overwhelmed. When people call and say, well, did you read this? Did you read this? And I'm going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I seen I a little it. cartoon on Facebook today that I thought was really, really cute. It showed a picture of the supposedly like the devil in Christ sitting looking down upon the globe of the world. And the devil says, well, I stopped every church. And Christ says, no, the church moved into every home. <laughs> Amen. That's cute. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the church, the church multiplied by your plan. <laughs> it turned Amen. around on yes. you. Yes, yes. I was picturing I the saying, well, that backfired. Yeah. <laughs> I think we better be ready, folks, because, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, a couple of the messages that went out, reached 1,400 people uh, mm -hmm. at New Testament. You know, some of the, the messages that Pastor Joy has been putting out in the nine live at nine each day and yeah. stuff like that. They're reaching 2,000 or more people. Uh, when this ends, and I believe that it will for whatever period of time that that might be, 
man, I, I believe we better be ready for the flood. You know, Amen. Because a lot of be people ready. are going to hit the churches, you know, because their hunger has been awakened now yeah. through all of this house churching. And they're going to be hungry for the churches whenever they can get out again. And we better be ready. No. It was. Amen. I think he will make us ready. Yeah. And then I think, you know, that we're going to get a time of, you know, it, everything's back to normal and everything's peaceful. And then who knows after that. Right. So. Amen. Right. <clears throat> I don't know about anybody else, but I could definitely use a church dinner. <laughs> I could use we, some we, chicken and shrimp cabanera from Olive Garden. Who's willing to do that? <laughs> oh, heck yeah, man. Heck yeah. <clears throat> I've been wanting that for at least two weeks now, and uh, I, I'm going to get it by the time my birthday gets there next week. So <laughs> I'm just wanting birthday. a pizza. <laughs> oh, that's easy to get, you know. No. Pizza. No, I don't know where the boxes came from. He's got me thinking, well, where did the box from the pizza that they got it in, you know? Well, so. you used to just be able to walk up to Nearings and get it, but Nearings is closed now. Yeah? Yeah, they closed right down. Yep. They're not even open no more. Mm -mm. I don't know if somebody there came down with it or something is the reason why they closed, because they were open every day from 9 to 5, and I'd even gotten a couple of pizzas from up there from them, you know, because they make pizzas <laughs> there, good yeah. pizzas. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and we went up there uh, to get something here the other day, a gallon of milk or something, and the doors were locked up. And I was like, okay, well, did they change their time? So I've, I've watched it now for two or three days, and I'm going, no, nah, they're just closed. They're not opening yeah, they're at closed. all. Yeah. They just closed up. So I don't know if somebody got sick there or something and they had to close or what, what, what happened because they were definitely getting a lot of business. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I'm not sure what happened there. The gas station by me did about the same thing. They closed up for like a week or two, and then now they're back open. So yeah, <clears throat> maybe they'll, they'll open back up. And maybe that's it. You know, maybe somebody came down sick, and they need to quarantine for two weeks, and they needed to close up for a couple of weeks, and then maybe they'll be back open again. Who knows? I don't know. You know. Or Diane just said maybe they're waiting on product, so we can't get it. Well, that could be, but they seem to have a lot of product on the shelves, uh, at least the last time I was in there before they closed. I was in there probably a couple of days before I noticed that the doors were closed, and they seem to have plenty of product, you know, wow. especially in meat because they they actually cut their own meat right there and yeah. package it and put it out fresh for everybody to buy. So, you know, they, also, they've got their own deli there and everything else, you know. It also kind of depends if it's a privately owned business or a small business. Some of them are closing to give their employees, if they don't have extra <coughs> employees, a chance to uh, recover or just in general have a break. That's true. And that could be as well, you know, and it is a privately owned business. It's not a corporation. So, you know, it's a mom and pop store. So. Yeah, they're just a lot of a lot of smaller stores are doing the whole like weaker week and a half thing just to uh, make sure people don't get 